Hi, Ken. How are you? I'm great, Douglas. And yourself? Doing fine. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Nice to see you. So you are in Canada, in Vancouver, yeah? That's right. Okay. Are you a lifelong Canadian? I am. I am. I used to live in Ottawa, but we moved out west uh, to escape the winters. Okay. I saw something on here I wanted to bring up right away. It says, you split your time, you and your wife split your time between North Vancouver and British Columbia's Sunshine Coast. I didn't think British Columbia had a Sunshine Coast. Well, I like to call it the ironically named Sunshine Coast, but yes, we do have one. <laughs> it's uh, just up the coast a ways. You have to go by ferry to get there, but it's beautiful. Is it on the border? I mean, is it between like Washington State? Uh, no, but on a clear day, you can see the Gulf Islands. You can't quite see the San Juan Islands, which are the American uh, islands off the Pacific. But uh, um, no, it's it's we're quite handy to the border, though. And my book is actually set in uh, Washington State, so we zip down fairly frequently. We have a son who lives in Seattle. Oh, okay, why is it called the Sunshine Coast then? Is it a joke? Uh, <laughs> That's cruel, just because you live in a sunny area. <laughs> but no, I honestly do believe it was probably some uh, real estate marketing guru who came up with that name. Oh, OK, but it does. Uh, the sun does shine there. Well, listen, being in Las Vegas, you know, I appreciate it when it rains. So <laughs> we're totally the other end of the spectrum from you. We certainly are. It's a little yeah. worrisome. Yeah. And not all that far. I mean, if you get on a plane, it's what, two hours? That's right. And you're in the middle of the desert and it can be 115 Fahrenheit. And I, I've been to the Seattle area. I don't remember ever going to Vancouver, but I've been in the Seattle area. Very nice, very beautiful. But yeah, uh, Seattle is, is lovely. Yeah. Vancouver, we have the mountains as well as the ocean. So uh, I think we're one up on them, but that's about it. Before turning to fiction, according to your bio, it says that you work 15 years uh, as a bureau chief for McLean's McLean's, right? Yes, Which that's is... uh, Canada's national news magazine. It would be the equivalent of uh, of uh, Newsweek and its prime or Time magazine. Oh, okay. Uh, 15 years, so you must have written. What was your most memorable story that you wrote? Well, why don't I tell you about the last story I did? I've actually okay. uh, left the magazine, but uh, before I did, I labored uh, on uh, Queen Elizabeth's by uh, um, obituary. And so I put that aside and it was updated later by a researcher and I didn't think anything about it anymore until uh, September 8th this year when she died. And uh, within seconds, my uh, 20, well, not, it was about a 15,000 word obituary suddenly popped up online. So, uh, and my uh, Twitter feed blew up. <laughs> so, Yes, that's been my last one. It was quite a challenge to uh, capture her life, even in 15,000 words. Well, how uh, far in advance did you write her, her obituary before she actually died? Uh, well, not to be ghoulish about it, uh, Douglas, but uh, probably about six years ago. Oh, OK. Right. Yeah. And then it's been updated successively uh, since then. There's been various uh, family dramas since then. So a very able researcher after I left the magazine uh, continued to keep it updated. Well, I think she surprised everyone because there was that the photo, the last photo taken of her where she was meeting the new prime minister. Yes. And she looked she looked frail, but she looked all right. And then what, 24 hours or 48 hours later, she was gone. Yes, uh, like it came as a bit of a, a shock. It doesn't make a lot of uh, sense to me that it came on so quickly, but uh, uh, I think she was just ready to go meet Philip. I suppose, yeah. Well, yeah. listen, um, I have nothing but good feelings about her. I, I don't get into politics and don't. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I don't I don't want to think about the monarchy, but I, yeah. I have a great deal of respect for her. And she's been a stabilizing influence that, uh, frankly, Britain has badly needed in the last little while. Not only Britain, but the whole world. <laughs> it's true and enough. I think she's a great representative that the entire world can look at and respect mm -hmm. as somebody who has been a stabilizing force for the past 70 years. And uh, I, I wish her well in the next adventure in her life, the next part. 
And, and her and her poor son. After all the years he's waited to become King King Charles the Third, we'll just have to see how he does now. You know, I never thought too much of him as a as a prince, but I, watching some of the video feeds from the funeral and where they've been going around uh, meeting people, I think he's doing a great job as a king. I think uh, he certainly had enough practice, but yeah, I think that's true. I, I think he's going to do all right. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, me yeah. too. Yeah. All right. So after that, after your 15 years at McLean's, uh, you started writing fiction? That's right. And previous to uh, the magazine, I worked for two uh, National Wire services. So uh, I had lots of, uh, lots of um, practice covering uh, death, disaster, and wonderful stories as well. I did a lot of traveling, uh, covered nine Olympic games and traveled the world for the magazine. So I had, it was an apprenticeship, shall we say, and, and that I've been able to carry into fiction. Okay, so the book is called Hero Haters. And is this your first published novel? It's my first published novel, my third attempt. It's taken a while to figure out this whole fiction thing after all the years of uh, scrupulously uh, being chained to facts, it, it took a little while to feel liberated, shall we say. What was the challenge to transition from writing well, journalism um, to fiction? I think fiction? it was a, a question of uh, finding the right balance between researching facts, because you have to root uh, even a fiction story in, in some facts to make it uh, credible, but not being chained to them. Like uh, So in my case, uh, when I was writing the the idea for this was to create a uh, a medal that uh, for heroism, and so my hero was a researcher who helped uh, vet the uh, the heroes to make sure that they were justified in getting this uh, high honor, the Sedgwick uh, medallion. Uh, then I decided, well, let's turn that on its ear. Not everyone. What if not everyone likes a hero? In fact, what if some people? Tar uh, target them. And so in this case, my uh, hero finds that the heroes that he's vetted uh, are banishing, they're being kidnapped. And uh, he doesn't know why, but he's become a suspect. Was this inspired by anything that you wrote in the nonfiction realm? Uh, no, I met a lot of uh, heroes, real and otherwise. I mean, uh, I covered, as I said, a lot uh, Olympic games. So there are sports heroes, but these are real life heroes. And I, I met a few of those along life's uh, road, but I also met a lot of, um, you know, heroes with feet of clay, you might say. So I, I the, these ones that I portray are genuine, selfless uh, heroes, acts of heroism, people who've uh, run into burning buildings and uh, pulled people out of flaming car wrecks or dove into uh, the rapids to rescue someone or to try to. Um, but I, as, as heartwarming as those stories are, I thought, uh, let's turn it on its ear. And what happens if uh, heroes are suddenly kidnapped and thrown into the dark web and uh, where, where uh, subscribers to some horrible website on the web are watching them perform these death-defying acts of heroism, uh, you know, online. Wow, okay, you know, for some reason the movie Saw just came into my mind. Really? Okay, I haven't seen that one, but it doesn't sound cheerful. It's pretty gruesome, actually. Mm. Um, okay, well, this sounds interesting. What genre would you put this book in? I would call it a, a contemporary adult thriller. A contemporary adult thriller, okay. Um, did you self-publish it, or is it traditionally uh, No, published? it's, uh, it's uh, published by uh, Wild Rose Press of New York State. Okay, yeah, I think I've actually heard of them. They might have come through the show at one point. Yeah, they're, uh, they're a wonderful uh, publisher. And uh, I wanted, since I set this one largely in Washington State and also in, uh, in uh, Pittsburgh area of Pennsylvania, I, I thought an American publisher would be best for it. And uh, they've been very accommodating. How long has the book been out? Uh, it actually comes out uh, on October 5th. It's available now on pre-sale uh, pre at Barnes and & Noble and uh, on Amazon, but uh, it, you can't get your hands on a copy till uh, October 5th. 
Okay. So I know couple... you people are terribly disappointed <laughs> by that, but it's not that uh, far away. Oh, I think we'll live. Have you received any reviews from anyone on the book? Uh, yes, I have. I've got some uh, uh, up on Goodreads right now. Amazon doesn't let you post them yet until they're released. But yes, I've got some five star reviews on uh, on uh, Goodreads and uh, some that I've posted on my website as well, uh, which is kenmcqueen.com, M-A-C-Q-U-E-E-N.com. And uh, they're been, they've been heartening because it's a little different than when you work for a magazine or a, a newspaper where, where you get instant feedback. This has been a COVID project that, you know, you're working in isolation and now all of a sudden you have to see, well, I hope somebody likes it. Can you make a comparison to your writing style or the book style to someone else? Uh, in a perfect world, I would like to think that I'm, uh, uh, I have a bit of the wit, shall we say, of a, a John Sanford or a Robert Cray, uh, a dark subject that can be leavened with some humor, believe it or not. And uh, so those are the kind of people that I would aspire to. And uh, like John Sanford, who's a wonderful writer, uh, he was a journalist as well. And uh, many of the uh, great fiction writers, it seems, were, uh, were uh, journalists as well. It might be good training for fiction, yeah, to do that. First. I think it is. It's uh, yeah. it does give you uh, a sense of rhythm of uh, of when people talk. You can uh, you can get an authentic uh, voice, I guess. Now, people when they talk, just as me when I talk, you you have to edit out a lot of what I say because it's uh, not as succinct as you would like. But you have to make it sound uh, authentic and real. As, as dialogue, but you have to also realize that you have to compress it. Uh, and that definitely works when you're in, in uh, journalism as well. You pick out the best quotes. Uh, you don't pick out the whole rambling interview. So I think that works well for, uh, for uh, the transition from uh, journalism to fiction. You have to have an ear for uh, good quotes, good dialogue. That's, I think that's good advice. Do you uh, anticipate there's going to be a part two to this? Is this going to turn into a series? I would like to think so. My uh, character, Jake Ockham, I, I quite like him. And I think he has I think he has legs. OK, all right. Well, sounds good. Uh, we do have to wind this down. We are running out of time very quickly. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, give out your website again, please. Uh, yes, it's Ken McQueen, M-A-C-Q-U-E-E-N dot com. OK, and the book is called Hero Haters and it will be released. October 5th, October 5th. All right, super. Well, Ken, thank you for coming on. It was nice meeting you. Best of luck with the book launch. I hope it does well. Thank you very much, Douglas. It's been a pleasure speaking with you.